My dear friends, I would like to give this speech both in French and English. Mes chers auditeurs, si ce serait possible, je voudrais bien vous parler et en anglais et en français. But malheureusement, on ne peut pas faire les deux ensemble. À cause de ça, je vous adresse en anglais. Mais j'adore le français, je dois vous dire. I know that one of the great problems confronting this whole conference is that in a very real sense, it's a conference about everything. One of the most encouraging things of the 70s is the way in which the whole human family has started to talk about the basic elements of its daily life, the needs of its citizens, food, population, the status of women, all beginning with the Stockholm realization that we belong to a single planet and however much we may still think of ourselves as politically separate in the most profound sense of sharing in all the great life support systems. We are one, inescapably one. And now here you are coming together to discuss how we live together in our settlements, this single species in a fragile planet which has got to find the way of its daily life. And quite clearly, it's much too big a subject for a conference. That obviously is clear. And I think one would have to say that all of you who are here have our support, our sympathy, our loving admiration for the way in which you're taking on an absolutely impossible task. But having said that, it does seem to me that the sheer scale of what you are thinking about is also a guarantee that what you do may be among the most important step forward taken by the human species to recognize its own condition. Because how can we recognize where we are unless we see the interconnections? The things that were thought of at Stockholm, at Rome, at Bucharest, in Mexico City, this is where they come together. And this is where the planetary future of this single precious species may well be decided. Now, where are we? A very nice question. And one of the problems, of course, is that many people will feel our position so unprecedented that we really haven't any guide to tell us where we are. I think Henry Ford, wasn't it, who said that history was bunk. Well, I wouldn't go as far as that, but I would say that it is perfectly, rel perfectly possible that the kind of quantum jump, the kind of scale of change in which we're living now makes the past, in some sense, irrelevant. And yet I think when Santayana said, those who will not learn from history are destined to repeat it, that is possibly a wiser approach. And if we look back, I think it is quite clear that in a sense, we are in the middle of one of the vast historical changes in the human condition, which if we can grasp, we can hope to guide. There have been them in the past. After all, we invented uh, uh, settled agriculture about 20,000 years ago. We invented that extraordinary mixture of urbanity and destruction, the city, about 5,000 years ago. And now, the entire planetary community is being drawn into the technological urban order. About one of industrialism and urbanism isn't 
features that we see in the world today were, as it were, already embedded in that early experience for evil, and then perhaps a little for good. So may I begin with this particular instance of a society, as it were, heaving itself into the urban and technological order, and what did it look like in the 1830s and 1840s, because that is about where the whole planet is today. Well, first of all, one would have to say that cities were being scrambled into without intention as the byproduct of something else. The industrial order was going forward and the cities were growing as they could. There was absolutely no control over the use of land. And by God, if you were a duke with a farm in Belgravia, hmm, could you tuck it away? The degree to which in the early cities, land speculation and the vast fortunes made very often, as I say, by these ducally families who weren't exactly on the side of poverty in the first place, is one of the most remarkable circumstances of early city building. The entire values of land created by the mere need of the expansion of the economy and of the new urban system ended up overwhelmingly in the pockets of the few. And that was one of the reasons why the early mark of our industrial technological system was a simply fantastic skew in income. Economists reckon that in the whole first 50 to 60 years of the industrial order in Britain, no part of the value added by the industrial system ended up with the working classes. It went entirely to the managerial and the property groups. And by the 1830s, the skew in income let us take a typical city, Manchester, archetypal city of the early industrial revolution. This skew in income, in which probably 90% of all the gain was going to 10% of the people, was beginning to show up in conditions which heaven knows are familiar to us today. Hunger. William Cobbett said that the average mill Children of five and six went to work in the factory. And if they were poor children, my friends, they went malignant so they couldn't get loose. The first legislation of any kind, the first factory had to won't believe this. Now we limited the work of children under ten to twelve hours a day in a seven day week. Well, I'll tell you something, there weren't many 10-year-olds who could survive that kind of week in that kind of condition. And that is what it was like in Manchester in those days. In addition, housing of the most incredible squalor. And I think, uh, I wish I could remember it, but I have to read it. This, I think, will give you a little vignette of the splendid environmental conditions of Manchester in the 1830s. It's describing the central river which took the full brunt of the entire effluent of this growing industrial city. Here we go. A narrow, coal black, foul smelling stream full of debris and refuse which it deposits on the shallow right bank. In dry weather, a long stream of the most disgusting, blackish, green slime pools are left standing on the bank, from the depth of which bubbles up miasmatic gas and gives forth a stench unendurable even on the bridge 40 or 50 feet above the surface of the stream. Ah, we think About that quotation is that it was in a letter from Friedrich Engels to his friend Karl Marx. Now, those were the conditions in the early cities. Growing up as the byproducts of an industrial process with a total skew in income, with hunger and with disease so that the average length of life of a laborer was 18 years, infantile death, and hanging over all this appalling environmental stench and corruption. That was the beginning of the industrial system. 
And so much so did it impress itself upon the imagination of contemporaries. You can look at it, for example, in the, in the novels of Dickens. But it was a conservative politician, Benjamin Disraeli, who I think best summed it up by saying, Britain is two nations, a nation of the rich and a nation of the poor. And that was the product of the first uncontrolled development of our technical industrial urban order. Well, I must say, if you then follow it on from 1840 to 1940, um, if you add in the number of depressions, the number of colonial wars, the number of growing conflicts in Europe crowned by two world conflicts and the invention of atomic energy for destructive purposes, you would say that it was a pretty lethal order and that the first 150 years of the techno-urban system does not perhaps give us the best hopes of survival on a fragile planet. But having said that, one would also have to say that in the developed world today, from San Francisco to Vladivostok, where the processes of technological change have gone forward, we do in fact find for the mass of the people not for all, there are tragic, disgusting, and disgraceful pockets of poverty in the wealthiest countries. But, in general, you would have to say that the condition of the people, compared with those of Manchester in 1840, have enormously improved. So in spite of the travail, in spite of the horrors, in spite of the difficulties, we cannot look back and say that this was a period of utter and total disaster. Something else was happening at the same time. And therefore, when we begin to look forward, history is not totally irrelevant, because we can ask ourselves, OK, which were the things that went better? What happened? What changed? What transformed the Manchester of 1840 to the really reasonably respectable Manchester of 1970? What happened in between? Because does this give us some clues to what we, as a planet, have to do? Are we in here confronting, as it were, a moment of truth which is not all doom, but which is also giving us clues to the future? Now, I'd like to suggest that there are one or two things here that explain to us how it was that in spite of the appalling start and of the continued um, troubles and difficulties of the last century, there are clues for better action. Some of them are good fortune, and we better recognize that. Some of them are policy. But together, they offer us some kind of guidance, the kind of guidance which a general conference of this kind can, as it were, sort out and turn into priority action. First of all, there was the lack of food. This was the period when all the temperate land of this planet was brought under the plough. And so that well-known, ascetic, memorable, and extremely respectable figure, Thomas Malthus, was proved to be not entirely right. He, if you recall, said that population would always rise to meet the resources available. That sounds a little more like Professor Parkinson, doesn't it? But never mind. Malthus was roughly on the same lines. And he believed, therefore, that there would always be a collision course between population and resources, that in that, as a result of this, wages would rise, they would squeeze out profits, etc. No, that was Ricardo, sorry, forget that one. Anyway, Malthus was the arch doomster, if you like, because he really said there was no way out. Now, with the coming of cheap food, and it became massively cheap after the American Civil War, in fact, so cheap that Britain stopped producing food all, almost altogether. We just got it from over the way. It's a little habit we've got to change. Uh, but the, at that period, with all the temperate lands coming under the plough, the Industrial Revolution went forward with a massive input of adequate and cheap food. And what was the result? Did population go on rising? No, no. When the children were better nourished, when they began to have the realization that their children weren't going to die, parents said, well, there's little Johnny and there's little Mary and there's little Richard. Hmm, uh -uh. perhaps they're going to live. 
well, then perhaps we don't need 15 more. And there came, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, wherever you got the movement towards a more abundant economy, you began to get a change in the population balance. That's part of it. Now, the second element of extreme importance was that a political process began, and wherever this political process was successful, the worst tragedies, the worst convulsions were avoided. There were two sides to it. One was the emergence of the conscience of the rich, and the other was the growth of unremitting and absolutely irresistible pressure from the people who had been unfortunate, the laboring masses, who began by their own strengthened efforts of self-help and self-reliance, mechanics institutes, friendly societies, the beginning of the trade unions, to create the kind of pressures which could be expressed politically, and in Britain were expressed through universal suffrage and the, well, only I, to say that universal suffrage in 1870 only stood for men, but you know, we've got forward a little bit since then. Anyway, universal suffrage pushing this pressure of the mass of the people, as it were, up against, if you like, let's call it, speak, let's have a cliche, a good old cliche, against the bastions of privilege. And quite frankly, the bastions of privilege began to give way. And it was Disraeli again who in 1840 had coined the phrase, the two nations, the nation of the rich and the nation of the poor. Mm -mm. After universal suffrage, he began to think about drains, public housing, popular education, and in fact, the beginning of the whole effort to have cities, not as residuals, but cities by design, in which some measure of human decency could be extended to the whole of the people. Heaven knows it wasn't complete. It isn't complete now. You've only got to go to Clydeside or Bronx and you'll know, heaven knows it's not complete. But I do maintain that where that dialogue of the rich with conscience and the poor with punch worked out, you began to move away from the total and desperate fatalities of revolution, collapse, and indeed war. So, in the first thing, we were lucky with food. The political process is more than luck. That was an attitude of mind and, as it were, creative confrontation. In addition, of course, we did then have, as a result, an enormous increase, a further increase in public health and a further, as it were, underlining of the ability of families or the desire of families to stabilize their, their size and by the time the industrial structures of the developed world were moving more and more towards capital-intensive industry and away from the simple, unskilled jobs of the early Industrial Revolution, universally, where the development changes had taken place, you began to get a greater balance between numbers, work, opportunity, and so forth. So the result was not cities exploding in misery and despair, it was the beginning of cities that were manageable and cities in which, in fact, you could live. So it's a mixture, as I say. It's a mixture, on the one hand, of an appalling start of continuing problems of a terrible kind, but one or two clues to how we can do better. Now, does that tell us anything about where we are now? Well, let's begin by saying quite clearly that we're in Manchester in 1830. That's where we are as a planet. And if Disraeli were alive today, he'd talk of the planet of the rich and the planet of the poor. And the proportions would be about the same because about 75% of the world's resources are controlled by about 20 to 25% of the world's peoples. We have transferred, if you like, to the whole planetary system as it struggles to enter into the technological order, we have transferred the early skew of the early industrial societies. That's number one. The next resemblance is that a large part of this world is hungry. Hungry as the, hungry as the mill hands in Manchester. Some of them starving as Europe's weavers starved in the 1840s. Again, the pressure of demand that cannot be satisfied 
for food because it cannot get into the pocket range of the workers. You had it in the 1840s, you have it now. Sanitation. Something like 40 to 50% of the human race is not certain of clean water. Something like 25 to 30% of the human race have these desperate diseases, cholera, typhus, dysentery, the killers of the 19th century. Above all, the most tragic, infantile gastritis, which in the Manchester of the 1840s meant that most of the children under five just died of intestinal complaints. And there are cities in the developing world today where 60% of the children who are born die of infantile gastritis before they're five. So again, there is some resemblance between a planet in the 1970s and a Manchester in the 1840s. We have contrived, in a sense, to have the same kind of bumbling, appalling, dreadful approach to the technological order which began it and which we have to some extent cleared, but which is still the lot of two-thirds of the human race. In addition, I would have to say that the conditions are in some ways worse. There is no more vast, fertile prairie land to bring under the plough. You can't do that twice. The entire world food surplus, which is now about 90 million tons, comes entirely from North America at this moment. If you were to have a period of drought, we would have a period of mass starvation. That cushion is not there. The next is that by curing a number of epidemics ahead of any change in the entire modernization structure, in some areas, population growth going ahead between 2.8 and 3% a year is double the 19th century growth, and it also means that the workforce is growing twice as fast. This means that there is an underlying unemployment problem which was not present in the same degree in the 19th century. And what is more, because in so many areas, the technologies that have evolved in the developed world, which have been based upon a very considerable availability of capital and a fairly high cost, increasing cost of labor, are precisely the technologies which do not match the experience of countries that are chiefly rich in their human resources and poor in their capital resources. So you get the phenomenon we know, that of the emptying out of the countryside into the cities to a 25% rate of unemployment as normal. Now those were conditions which did not prevail in the 19th century and which make our task, in fact, more difficult today. The cities, in a sense, have come before the jobs. In Europe in the 19th century, in every case, the jobs were pulling in the people into the cities. And this is a critical change. So we do resemble the 1840s, but in certain very critical ways, the situation is worse. And that means that the crisis is potentially greater. And what is more, in between the, the confrontations and difficulties of the 19th century and what could lie ahead of us in the next 25 years when onto this skewed planet, we may be adding another planet to the same size. One of the great differences is that we have invented nuclear destruction and we therefore have the possibility, quoting again from Engels and Marx, that we could achieve the common ruin of the contending parties because nuclear war is a respecter of nobody. Victor, vanquished, it's the same. So are we to say that after all, Henry Ford was right. It's bunk. The whole exercise of looking back is irrelevant. But looking back to the beginnings of this industrial and urban order, well, it's a waste of time. The conditions have changed so much that it teaches us nothing. Well, I maintain no. And one of the things that this conference could do is to pick up some of the points where the lessons are clear and get them into the world's dialogue in time so that as we build for another planet, as we build as many settlements in the next 30 years as have been built in the whole of human history, some of these lessons are learned and that you here at Vancouver start mankind on a wiser course. Because it is two planets, the planet of the rich and the planet of the poor. 
What shall we learn from the 19th century success stories? How shall we apply them? Well, let's take first of all the critical one of food, because although I know man liveth not by bread alone, I don't know whether any of you have tried getting on without it, because it doesn't last very long, all of three weeks. So let's begin with food. We cannot have the cushioned free food of the great prairies again. But what we can have and what you can carry up here at this conference are the resolutions of the Rome World Food Conference which were perfectly specific about an emergency food stock for uh, immediate emergencies, a grain reserve system which can carry over with regularity from harvest to harvest so that the larger emergencies are avoided and above all, and I was delighted to see last week that the, a start has been made and the World Food Council meets immediately after Vancouver. So please direct a running kick at that conference with some splendid resolutions about food. Uh, that conference can begin the systematic investment in developing world food supplies, which will mean that over the next 25 years, the equivalent of the prairies can come into being by the full-scale development of the agricultural potential of the developing countries. We know what it means. It's a 5% growth rate a year. It's something like a 25 to $30 billion investment with perhaps five to six billions coming from the already rich as stimulus and as, as, as prod, as it were, to the process. It means, and this is where it's closely linked with settlements, it means putting an end to the position in which agriculture is the Cinderella of the economy. It means seeing that intermediate settlements for marketing, for, for the sale of goods, for the building up of cooperatives, it means that you've got to have a national settlement system in which agriculture is given its full weight and so that this can be the basis of the national life because we cannot rely upon cheap food from somewhere else, it's got to be at the core of the plan. So, okay, we don't have good luck, but we can correct it by good policy. Now, the second thing, the political process itself. Those of you who represent the developed countries, the wealthy countries, whether new rich or old rich, remember there has never been a single case in history of an elite entrenched in power and wealth and unready to share, they have always collapsed. I have no doubt that could any of us go and eavesdrop on the vomitoria of Rome or the hot baths of the gentlemen, we'd find them muttering about the Visigoths. Well, they were right. So let us remember that there is no record in history of an entrenched minority controlling 80 to 90% of the wealth, whether it's internally inside the country or in the planet as a whole, it doesn't last. And what is needed is therefore conscience, yes, if we can have it. But I'd say that fear too is the beginning of wisdom and I'd like to see us running a little bit more scared. And that will depend upon the other side of the dialogue. The developing peoples have got to keep the pressure up. And there are two aspects to the pressure. One is the realization that if the mass of the people are mobilized to do their own thing in their cities, to build up, drive away the feudal restraints on agriculture, get them into their cooperatives, get them organized, these are the biggest resources the world has. So often we sound like Victorian duchesses going down to the dockers in London to lecture the poor into thrift and continence. It makes me sick, I must confess. Why not see that here, coming up in the developing world, are the human resources for an immense task if they can be liberated, if they can be made part of the job itself? Could not one of the messages from this conference be for agriculture, for the building of cities, take the biggest resource, which is the people's courage, the people's ability to work, the people's readiness to do so, don't treat them as problems, treat them as partners, and you'll be astonished at what they'll do. That, I think, is one of the... <laughs> and God knows in the building of settlements, the kind of settlements 
that people build for themselves are infinitely more human than those which, in fact, are built for them. Our beloved friend Margaret Mead coined a marvelous aphorism over this weekend, and I hope she'll forgive me if I pass it on, and that is, no one has ever built a really good home for someone of a lower class, and this is true. In other words, people build better for themselves. Now, and in the settlements policies that are advocated here, give this drive, give this openness to what people can do the highest priority in your thinking. Now, but if you're going to do that, two things must be remembered. And we say this, we the developed market economies, we have to say this, beating our breasts at our failures. You will not be able to do this if you rely on a speculative land market to do your city building for you. If it could give us good cities, we'd have them now. We haven't. And one of the reasons is that the function of a market, and it's a very legitimate, it's an even a magnificent function of the market, is when price signals go up to produce more goods. Well, you know what Mark Twain's father is said to have said? He said to him, Mark, no, he wasn't. I can't remember what his real name was. Never mind. We'll say it was Mark. Mark, my son, buy land. They're not making any more of it. Well, <laughs> therefore, the justification of the market, which is a rising price increases greater supply, doesn't work with land. It's fixed. Now, this doesn't mean that ownership of land may not be a tremendous safeguard of the citizens' individuality, of their sense of dignity, in fact, the number of people in the developing world for whom owning their own house is a sort of acme of what they want. But there is absolutely no right to the public sale of land so that the development rights end up with the modern equivalents of the Dukes of Belgravia. What we need is, if you like, private ownership, public sales. And let the control of city land, which is an absolutely scarce resource, let it be with the community, and those gains which come from the value added by the community's needs must go back to the community, because otherwise, where will the funds come from to build us decent cities? Let that, I plead with you, be at the center of your thinking here at Settlements. In addition, with this certainty of the community recouping the gains which it has itself created, you can then go on to one of the most creative changes of the 19th century, the beginning of those support systems which enable citizens to have the strength, the ability, the health, the self-confidence to help themselves. And this means all the systems of sanitation that we need, all those services which the citizen, however well-intentioned, however energetic, cannot supply himself. And will you forgive me if now I make one special plea, and that is for the 40% of the people of this world who haven't got clean water. If one thing could sweeten the world and the world's imagination would be if from Habitat came out a resolution that by a specific date, the most undignified aspect of human living and I can tell you what it is, it's running at both ends, that's what it is. If you could get rid of that, what you would have done for human happiness and dignity would be absolutely incommensurate with anything else we've talked about. We're thinking of one thing. I want us to think of a lot of things, I hasten to add, but for the one thing, let it be clean water for every child of man, say by 1990. Why not? Why not? And the reason why not... I'll tell you the reason why not. It is not a prime objective of governmental will. And this is where the dialogue between the lucky and the unfortunate, between the rich who we hope will have conscience, and the poor who must exercise every means of pressure. This is where we have to be absolutely and brutally frank. I read, for instance, in a report from Nairobi that one very, very well-provided Western government that should be nameless remarked that they couldn't 
possibly start, provide six billions. Well, I mean, the whole Western world couldn't provide six billions for the buffer stock program because that would set in motion again the inflation in the Western world. Six billion, dear God. Now, let's be clear about this. There are two great sources which could provide now a decent life for everyone on Earth in terms of the basic human minimum dignity that they require. One of those sources is the appalling wastefulness of the technological order of the developed world. If you see figures where of the energy that is produced, up to 40% is wasted. Has it ever struck you what an utter idiocy a cooling tower is? You get a generator, you pump it up, you put in the fuel, you get out all that heat, huh, then you have a cooling tower to get rid of it. Thus, isn't that sensible? Now, if you had what you're beginning to have all over Scandinavia, which is district's heat systems, all that heat is then used, in fact, for heating the homes and the commercial premises. Instead of having what we have now, which is a 35% use from our generating systems, you can get it up to 75%. Don't talk to me about inflation, when the most inflationary thing we're doing is chucking away 50% of the precious energy which we need for our technological order. It carries on into other things. Look at our chuck away society. Every one of those bottles, every one of those cans recycled uses 80 to 90% less energy than the, than, than the production from raw materials. Does anyone know? Does anyone care? No, they don't. And if we in the developed world want to produce the resources for the next 25 years, then let's look at our waste. And I would beg you at this co conference, look at all the recycling and conserving possibilities that are coming up, which are getting more and more interesting, which mean, incidentally, that you don't have to be hustled, dear friends, into the nuclear option on the grounds that we're going to run out of everything by 1990. Don't you believe it? We're wasting 50% now, and we have 300 years of coal. Let's take our nuclear option very quietly, please. Because when you consider that old canisters out in the Pacific and the Atlantic are now beginning to leak plutonium after 25 years, when we've heard so much about how absolutely certain it is that all these wastes can be uh, safeguarded, watch it, I say. Don't be hurried into this option. And remember that partly as a result of our energy crisis, a whole new range of technologies, including a technology which would use the resource of which the developing world has the most abundant supply, and that is, thank God, sunshine, solar energy, wait, don't be stampeded. It may be all right, but don't get into it on the grounds that everything's going to run out in the next 25 years. Don't you believe it? It's only going to run out because we're wasting it. <laughs> now, the second great source, you know it as well as I do. It's the biggest, most inflationary boondoggle in the whole history of humanity, and that's the arms program. $300 billion a year. Now, you can blow up the planet 20 times over with that, and I'd have thought once was enough, but there you are, you never know. I'm not a military expert, so maybe 20 times over is better. But anyway, $300 billion a year. Now, this is the most inflationary form of spending there is, for the reason that they told us over and over and over and over again in World War II, and that is that if you create arms and pay wages for the creation of arms, there is nothing to mop up the wages because people can't go out and buy their friendly neighborhood howitzers, or at least not yet. You know, what's the latest line in tax this week? You know, well, we can't do it. Therefore, the wages slop about in the economy, and we have $300 billion of slop over because we are so frantically institutionalizing our fears and our hates that we haven't enough left to give ourselves the real security, which is the security of being neighbors and friends. Now, if we could, and if you could at this conference, revive a resolution which was made in the United Nations General Assembly under the sponsorship of the Soviet Union in 1973, 
and then sank without trace, as far as I can see. And if you're interested, it's Resolution 3093, and then in brackets, um, Roman uh, 17, from the 2194th plenary meeting of the UN General Assembly of the 7th of December 1973, the proposal was to cut arms spending by 10%, which would now give us 30 billions. Well, it gets a bit weasley after that because it then suggested that 10% of that should be dedicated to development, and that brings us down to 3 billion, which of course is not on the generous side. But notice that $3 billion a year would be enough, according to World Bank figures, to provide clean water in 10 years' time. Can you not go back to that resolution? <laughs> Can you not set in process here at least the first step towards realizing the lunacy of 300 billions for the weapons of death and not even 3 billions for the means of life. If that was one of your themes, heavens how the world would respond. Because then we'd know that the creative dialogue between the conscience and the fear of the rich and the pressure and the determination of the poor was beginning as in the most hopeful aspects of the 19th century to turn into the possibility of better cities, more basic health, better chances for the children, the beginnings of education, the beginnings of cities worthwhile living, in which the promise of urbanity, of civilization, is not a dirty word, but something that's real and true. Can you not begin here to end this terrible, terrible resemblance to necropolis, to the city of death, and begin instead to begin the city of man. Oh, it'll be a long journey, but as the Chinese say, a journey of a thousand days must begin with the first step. I beg you, take that step here, and let the spirit of Vancouver and the memory of Vancouver be one of hope. Thank you. Yeah, 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 all right. <laughs> all right. Yeah, 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 all right. <laughs> all right. But, 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 